I shot him six times. What's going on, horror fanatics? Welcome to I Shot Him Six Times YouTube Horror Movie Channel. As you know, I'm your host and creator of the channel, Marcus. If you have not done so already, please shoot this video a like. It helps out with the YouTube algorithm a ton. As well as if you're a new viewer to this channel, please shoot that subscribe button as well as that notification icon so you get all the latest content updates to the channel. In this video, I will be doing a double spoiler review for the movies Last Shift and the reimagining of Last Shift, Malum. So if you have not seen either one of these films or have not seen Malum, being that Malum actually was released a couple weeks ago, then this video may not be for you as this video will contain spoilers for both films. Before I get into the review, I want to give a shout out to both Bob from Hunting for Entertainment as well as Eric the Bearded Entertainment for putting me onto both of these films as I knew nothing about Last Shift or Malum. And if you guys are not subscribed to their channel, guys, go subscribe to their channels. They're both great guys and have great content. And I will say that I really enjoyed both of these films, even though they're different versions of the same film. Both films are worth the watch, so if you have not watched Last Shift or Malum, don't waste any more time. Go peep these movies out. They are really good, in my opinion. Director Anthony de Blasi has a really unique vision, and I really enjoyed both films. We start off with Last Shift, where we are introduced to our main character, Jessica Lauren, who is portrayed by Juliana Harkavay in this film. And you see her out in her squad car on the phone having a conversation with her mother, where you hear through the dialogue, her mother is pleading with her not to be a police officer, not to follow in the same footsteps as her father. However, Jessica is defiant with her mother's pleas and decides to go forward with the night, as well as just being a police officer in general, as you will find out later on in the film, and I'm going to just tell it now, that she has something to prove in terms of following in the footsteps of her father. As Jessica enters the police station, we get introduced to Sergeant Cohen, who is seen at the end of the hallway, frustratingly slamming his fists up against the lockers, cussing out something. We don't know what that is, at least until later on in the film, but he definitely seems to be having a dramatic moment before realizing Jessica is there. After calming down, he does seem to go over the rules of what Jessica has to do for the night. Basically, all she has to do is complete the last shift there at the police station as they built a new police precinct and that all calls have been rerouted to the new station so that all she basically has to do is sit there and essentially do nothing but wait for these hazmat workers that are supposed to come by and pick up some evidence that was not picked up earlier in the week. After the sergeant leaves, Jessica then receives a phone call, which is very strange to her, being that the sergeant just told her that all calls have been rerouted to the new station. However, she picks up the call, and on the other end, it's a mysterious young woman who is pleading for help. But before Jessica can get any further information, the girl hangs up. After hearing some mysterious noises coming from the hallway, Jessica then proceeds to go back up front just to make sure that the station is clear. After looking outside the front door, she then turns around only to find this, this mysterious homeless man standing in the middle of the lobby to where she proceeds to tell him, you cannot be in here, this is a police station. But the man does not respond, only urinating on the floor, which prompts Jessica to really get in his face and prompts her to push him out the door. She then goes into the bathroom, gets a mop, cleans up the urine, but while she was in the bathroom, she sees these boots that were sitting on top of the cabinet, to where she takes the boots, sits them out front of the police station as some type of peace offering to the man, being that he was homeless and was barefooted and was not seen wearing any shoes. After hearing some more mysterious noises coming from the hallway and as well as the locker area, you then see Jessica proceed to go investigate to where she goes and finds her dad's old locker, number 25. Inside the locker is a picture of her and her father. But what happens after is when things start to really start to ramp up in the film. As when Jessica goes to leave, you see every single locker room door that was closed inside the locker room open. After hearing more noises in the back room of the station, Jessica goes to investigate only to find the same homeless man she just removed from the lobby standing on a shelf throwing what seems to be old case files on the floor. After once again telling the man that he cannot be there, the man lunges at her prompting her to use her baton, cuff, and detain him. 
She proceeds to take him to the holding cell where she gets locked in with him as the door shuts and the lights cut off mysteriously. As she tries to pry open the door, she flashes her light through the glass only to be flustered when a dead person with a sheet wrapped around his face with a satanic symbol imprinted on it appears. After dropping her flashlight, you then see what appears to be the homeless man flashing the light on her. She asks for it back, reminding the man that she is a police officer, among other things, only to find out that there is someone or something else in the room with them, as the light flashes on the man, proving he's not in possession of the flashlight. After realizing this, Jessica gets up off the floor when two more bag-faced creatures show up, before the lights cut back on and the door unlocks for her to exit. After experiencing self-doubt about completing the shift, Jessica then calls Sergeant Cohen to let him know, only to back out and leave a more encouraging message on his voicemail. As she goes to stretch in her chair, she sees the words, So, written on the ceiling, which means female pig, for those wondering in reference to Jessica being a female cop. After seeing this, she locks the front door and proceeds to lock the back, before noticing a woman standing out back smoking a cigarette. This is where the story starts to unfold. After initially telling the woman she couldn't be there, they strike up a conversation where the woman tells Jessica she was at the station the day that John Michael Payman, the main antagonist and his cult, or quote-unquote family, were brought in alive to the police station. This is important because Jessica responds by telling the woman the family was killed on scene of the crime, as this is what she was told being that her father captured and supposedly killed John Michael and the family on scene of his ranch, where he and his family abducted and killed multiple teenage girls. However, the woman insists the family were brought into the police station alive as she goes into detail saying she heard them bragging about what they did. She also says they kept her up all night singing this eerie song, the same eerie song Jessica heard coming through her radio moments prior before putting the homeless man in the holding cell. The woman caps off the conversation by saying the family used their own bed sheets to sacrifice themselves to put it in an appropriate way. But when she looked into their cell the next morning, the bodies were gone. After telling the story and finishing her cigarette, the woman leaves. Jessica then heads back inside and as she walks through the hallway, she realizes these videos playing on the TV screens inside of her room. And it's videos of the Payman family in the police station interrogation room speaking of their crimes, which lines up with what the woman outside was just telling Jessica. After getting attacked by some chairs, Jessica escapes the room only to hear the phone ringing once again. She picks it up and it's the young lady Monica again, pleading for help as well as singing she keeps hearing singing, which turns out to be the same eerie song heard earlier in the film. Jessica asks for Monica's last name as well as her age, to which Monica responds by saying her last name is Young and that she's 17 years old. Jessica then tells Monica that she needs to hang up and call 911, but Monica only says that the redial button is the only button that is working at the moment. Jessica tells Monica to run as best as she can, but also asks if she heard of the name John Michael Payman before, to which Monica responds by saying that she thinks so, but before disclosing any more details, she hangs up. Jessica proceeds to call the new station, as she did earlier in the film, to give her fellow officer on the other end an update on Monica. She proceeds to tell him that she believes the rest of the Payman family have her, to where the man laughs but quickly realizes that Jessica is serious. So he proceeds to tell her the family scattered and are under constant surveillance, and tells her to get a pen, and gives her a name, John Victor Ida 15236, and tells her if she gets any more information to reference that report number when she calls back. Jessica then hears more noises coming from another room, she checks it out, and after the chairs that are in the room mysteriously get stacked on top of each other, she starts to believe everything is a joke by her fellow police officers. This thought is further validated in Jessica's mind when she hears a knock at the main entrance door, and it's a fellow officer by the name of Officer Price. After accusing him and other officers of messing with her, he assures her that he is just there to check up on her. After some light flirting, Price tells Jessica that he knew her father, and was there the night everything went down with the Payman family. He discloses they were ordered to wait for backup, but after hearing the girls begging for their life, they went in and the payments opened fire. He was able to pull four of the girls out while Jessica's father held off the family. He proceeds to tell her the family killed six more girls and two officers, including Jessica's father. He goes on to tell Jessica that her dad was a good cop and that he would be proud of her. After stating he had to leave and that if she needed anything, he'd come back to check up on her, 
Price goes to walk away, only for Jessica to see a huge bullet hole with brain spatter in the back of Price's head. She watches him as he vanishes into thin air instead of walking out of the front door, further blurring the lines for Jessica on whether what she's seeing is real or not. After going to see if she sees Price leave out of the front door, she starts to hear voices as well as feel a spiritual presence amongst her. As she looks toward the entrance, she sees another sheeted covered dead person, which looks to be John Michael Payman, levitating before her own eyes. After the illusion goes away, she then hears the homeless man in the holding cell screaming begging for help. As she goes to open a door, she sees illusions of all three Payman family members hanging from the ceiling. Jessica further questions if what she's seeing is real. She then proceeds to hear that same eerie song being sang in a room down the hall. As she makes her way, you see this dead girl crawling behind her, bones crackling and all, before Jessica turns around and the girl disappears. Jess continues to follow the singing as she sees a group of girls sitting Indian style in a circle. You then see the girls each have a sheet with the same symbol in blood imprinted on it before they disappear as well. Jessica then proceeds to pick up the phone to call Sergeant Cohen to let him know that she's seeing things and that she might not be able to finish the shift. But after some criticism from the sergeant, she agrees to ride it out. She then calls the hazmat workers for an ETA for arrival to where Joe says to her they're still behind. They'll let her know later to where she responds she'll be in her squad car waiting. After stepping out to go to her car, you hear a heavy breath before fog appears on the window further confirming the payment spirits live throughout the station. The phone starts to ring again, and before Jessica makes it back to her car, she hears it and comes back inside. She picks it up, and it's Monica again claiming she escaped and is in the woods but feels the family is really close to her before the call drops. Jessica then proceeds to call back her fellow colleague at the new station using the John Ida reference code that he gave her earlier in the film, only for him to inform her that Monica Young has been dead for a year and was the last girl killed by the Payman family as she was brutally beaten with a baseball bat. He further goes on and say only three of the family members were caught but that there was over a dozen in the community, further telling Jessica that she may be right about there being more members out there and that it could be them playing a sick joke on her. But then the officer goes in and telling Jessica it was more than just rusty pipes that caused them to get out of that building and make a new one. He further goes on to confirm what the woman said to Jessica earlier in the film, that the payments didn't die on scene like the news said, and that they committed the S-word in the holding cell of the police station, and ever since, things have been weird in that station, to put it nicely. Starting with small things like the lights flickering, before it escalated to the point they couldn't house perps because they'd freak out, so the captain pleaded with the county for a new station. Before he could finish, a photo drops on the floor out of nowhere, prompting Jessica to hang up. She then picks up the photo only to realize it's her dead father, prompting an emotional response and rightfully so. She then sees multiple photos show up of the victims of the Payman family, before the entire hallway is covered with them, including one that shows Officer Price. An overwhelming sea of quotes from the Payman family hinder Jessica's hearing, and the photos catch on fire before Jessica passes out for a brief moment. After coming to and hearing her cell phone ring, she picks it up and it's her mother who sounds very worried for Jessica, but before the conversation could go far, Jessica realizes her gun and her baton are missing from her belt. She hangs up and briefly searches for the weapons, before getting knocked out by someone with her baton. It's revealed the person with the gun and the baton is another one of the Payman family cult members who Jessica questions is even real or not, as she still is in the middle of whether this is really happening or or if this is all in her head. After the girl threatens to shoot Jessica to test her theory, Jessica settles in as the girl goes on to profess her love for John Michael Payman. She asks Jessica if she's seen him there tonight, and as Jessica's facial expression gave it away, the girl says she knew it and felt him as tonight is the one-year anniversary of his death, and that she's there to celebrate it before turning the gun on herself. As Jessica looks in shock and disbelief, she retrieves her gun only to hear the phone ringing once again. She answers it, and it's Monica once again, but just now knowing the truth, Monica is dead, calls this out, in which the caller responds with a sinister laugh before you hear the baseball bat that killed Monica hitting her through the phone. 
Jessica then witnesses the desk moving to what she looks underneath to see the spirit of Monica Young right before her very eyes. This was the same spirit you've seen crawling behind Jessica earlier in the film in the hallway. As Jessica hides in fear in between the shelves, the spirit of Monica Young sees her and proceeds to get up close, before Jessica pleads for her to go away, to which, when turning her head forward, she sees the spirit has vanished. She makes a beeline for the front door, only to realize that she has been locked in from the inside. She pulls out her gun and fires shots at the windows, only to realize that her bullets aren't working. She then receives a phone call on her cell from her dead father, who proceeds to tell her how much he is proud of her, to which she responds, I did it for you. He then proceeds to question her, asking why is she trying to leave, further saying, I laid down my life for this job, I expect you to do the same. This prompts Jessica to stay, as he finishes the conversation, saying the man who took your father's life is still in this building, I want you to do something about it. After the call ends, she sees the homeless man walk past her, somehow escaping the holding cell. She has him once again get on his knees in an attempt to recuff him, only to see the man turn into a demon. The lights go out, and the man vanishes. Jessica then goes to the holding cell to see if what she just saw was real, only to find the man hanging from the ceiling in the same fashion as the Payman family. She also takes note to graffiti on the wall, that says King of Hell. She radios in for assistance only re to receive static with the Payman family's song coming through the radio before blood pours out of her radio as well. Another sheet-faced demon jump scares her before the door shuts once again, locking her in. She then turns around and sees an illusion of the Payman family doing their ritual in the holding cell. She touches the sheet as she seems to weirdly be drawn to the family, based on what she sees. As Payman masks himself and the two girls, he then removes the sheet, showing the demon he has become. After seeing this, Jessica goes to the door that suddenly opens once again. She then sees Officer Price, who jokes that he's not fucking with her before he shows her his demise. Payman himself then jump scares Jessica, as she then runs and she notices on a door the picture of her and her father that she saw in his locker earlier in the film. She then goes on to repeat a monologue from the police handbook about remaining loyal to service no matter what, before receiving another phone call from her dead father. Her father proceeds to tell her that they are coming and that she has to stop them. She asks him who is coming before hearing some commotion up front. She then encounters three men with sheets over their face who seem to be a part of the Payman family who continue to hurl out insults and barbs at her. After taking out each one of them, including a fourth member, Jessica is shockingly shot by Sergeant Cohen as it is now 4 a.m. and he is there to relieve her shift. It is then realized that the sheeted men that Jessica thought to be part of the Payman family are actually the hazmat workers that were expected to show up at some point throughout the night, basically implying everything Jessica saw throughout the night wasn't real. However, as you see Sergeant Cohen call the events in, you hear Jessica singing the Payman family song. Cohen then disappears as the family emerges and places sheet on Jessica's face as the movie ends. In my opinion, I believe the moral of the story is that Jessica wanted to live up to the expectations of her father as a police officer, which is why even when she knew she should have left the station, she didn't. It was about proving doubters like her mother wrong, but also proving herself right that she could do this, while being completely unaware to what truly happened at the police station or with her father's and the Payman family in general, which is the complete opposite when it comes to the character in Malum. Okay, everyone, I now move on to Malum. I'm not going to go scene for scene like I just did with Last Shift. I'm just going to go through what's different in Malum compared to Last Shift, especially when it comes to the Jessica Lauren character. The film starts off by introducing Captain Will Lauren, Jessica's father. He's at the police station seemingly reading a newspaper clipping about the girls he saved from John Michael Malum. Both of these, in terms of introducing Will, as well as the name change from Payman to Malum, are very different from the original version. And in my opinion, Malum is a better touch than Payman, as Malum actually means the word evil. After wallowing in the fact he couldn't save one of the girls, Will then leaves the locker room only to pass the same holding cell 
the Malum family sacrificed themselves in. He stops and stares as if he sees something. What happens next is truly shocking. Will then proceeds to take out every fellow police officer in the station before sacrificing himself as with a message to his daughter and her mother that he is very sorry before uttering his praises for his quote-unquote master. We then get introduced to both Jessica and her mother, Diane, played by Jessica Sula and Candace Cook, respectively. The difference here is you actually see the mother in this film, as in Last Shift, you only heard her on the phone. Diane plays a very important role in this film, as she was actually in John Michael Malum's cult before and even after Jessica was born. You find out that we'll save both Jessica and Diane from John, as John had big plans for Jessica, being the quote-unquote low god has been in his ear about her even before she was even born. Subsequently, Jessica is the chosen one. The in-depth backstory on the family's connection to Malum is the most different thing about Malum compared to Last Shift, and in terms of making sense of what's happening is a nice touch. But in order for Jessica to truly be a part of the ritual, she must kill a live human for infinite power, not just for her and John Malum, but mainly for the quote-unquote low god himself. This all comes to fruition when Jessica accidentally kills her mother after having illusions of the Malum family attacking her in the police station all night. She then sacrifices herself to complete the ritual, much to the pleasure of all the spirits in the station, before taking her rightful place on her throne next to John Malum. The main difference about Jessica's character in Malum compared to Last Shift is her motive was reversed. Sure, she wanted to follow in her dad's footsteps as a cop, but she mainly wanted to get full detail on his relationship and rivalry with John Michael Malum, as well as uncover why her father snapped and killed his fellow police officers that day at the police station. As I stated earlier in the video, both versions are really enjoyable. I did like Malum a little bit more because of the backstory of the characters, but nonetheless, both films are really good and worth the watches, and both actresses in Juliana Harkavay and Jessica Sula did a great job in their roles as Jessica Lauren and really carried both films. I will also say I thought in Last Shift, the mockery of the devil was interesting as the family suggests a greater power than the devil named the quote-unquote low god, and in Malum, they explore that even more by actually introducing the low god to Jessica, which I thought was another nice touch. But okay, everyone, that is it for this video. Leave a comment in the comment section below and let me know your thoughts on Last Shift and Malum. Have you guys seen these films yet? And if you have not, definitely go check them out. Come back here, hit the comment section, and let me know what you guys thought. Once again, this is I Shot Him Six Times YouTube Horror Movie Channel. I'm your host and creator of the channel, Marcus. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon. Thank you all for watching.